le damos la bienvenida al ingeniero Manuel Bexler con, las conferen con la conferencia El uso de la banda ancha móvil nacional para enriquecer la vida digital. El ingeniero Bexler actualmente se desempeña como director de marketing de las TIC para Norte y Latinoamérica en Huawei Technologies. Es experto en banda ancha, fija e inalámbrica, TIC, IMS, NGN, arquitecturas de red, economía y operaciones. Ha participado en múltiples foros sobre transformación de las industrias TIC en TI y TC, tendencias, comunicaciones ejecutivas y penetración de mercado. FMC, IMS, Wi-Fi, marketing y ventas, incluyendo la planificación técnica y de negocios en Latinoamérica, Norteamérica, Asia y Europa, la planificación de la estrategia y la planificación anticipada para los servicios fijos y móviles, entre otros. Wexler cuenta con experiencia en gestión de producto, gestión de proyectos y programas, fusiones M y A, operaciones de conocimiento a fondo del cliente, planificación, estrategia, servicios y marketing. Negocios, comunicaciones regulatorias y multiculturales de, como por ejemplo, Estados Unidos, Canadá, México, Brasil, China, Francia, el Reino Unido, etc. Está certificado como ejecutivo de mercadeo por la Universidad de Queens en Ontario, Canadá. Es ingeniero de red por la Universidad de Toronto y Northern Networks Ontario, Canadá, y cuenta con un máster en Ingeniería Eléctrica y Electrónica de la Universidad de Jassy en Rumania. Démosle entonces la bienvenida al ingeniero Bexler. Ok, uh, it looks we have a last minute technical uh, difficulty. They cannot find my presentation on the... Um, so, uh, I'll ask for a minute. And maybe we use this time if you need the um, a translator. There are some translators outside because the. Okay. Uh, I will. Um, I think we'll have to wait for a minute, but um, the presentation actually is looking on a different direction. Uh, I started to look at IoT from the viewpoint of the carriers and also from the viewpoint of different um, regulators and policy makers in the region. I'm working primarily with uh, the policy regulators in uh, Mexico. And as you know, in Mexico, there is a, uh, one of the largest transformation I've seen in the industry. Starting last year, the Mexico government uh, had changed the constitution of the country to allow telecoms to actually have investment, foreign investments up to 100%. They also announced a uh, uh, very different and novel plan, and I would say revolutionary, by allocating the whole 700 megahertz spectrum to uh, one carrier, which still has to be, um, uh, st still has to be uh, nominated. Uh, and um, this whole uh, spectrum is going to be used to create a carrier of carriers, a wholesaler for uh, LTE. And they are going to use LTE APT um, technology or APT standards. Uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, they expect, and uh, this is again a, a new model, a completely new business model, which of, of course will affect everything from education to Internet of Things, to health, to, uh, um, mob, uh, to mobile um, government and so on. Uh, this network will cover about 98% of the country, no, or 98% uh, rather of the people in the country. Uh, and they expect that they were going to create an industry of MVNOs, mobile virtual network operators, which will use the 700 megahertz spectrum to, um, uh, to create different business models. Again, from simple and SMS and data, the traditional MVNO model, to specialized MVNOs, which will uh, de um, deliver mobile voice, uh, uh, sorry, mobile um, uh, health, education, 
uh, and um, also to, to transform this into an, an Internet of Things for, uh, for the MVNOs. Uh, they still seem to have uh, difficulties with the presentation. I hope they... Okay. Uh, as you can see, the Internet of Things is still not working when, on the older technology. So maybe to, to continue a few more minutes, and uh, I'll show some of this in, in the presentation as well. Uh, one of the topics uh, which are important for the regulators in the region, including Mexico, including Colombia, is the creation of the national broadband plans. Uh, there are different plans, and each country in the region tends to go into a different direction. Uh, however, as I'll, I'll show later, the um, policies, the number of policies toward uh, um, broadband, toward uh, uh, internet uh, connectivity, toward massification of the internet are growing in the region. And I'll, I'll still want to show you some slides, if I can. Okay. Um, let, let me go back for a, a minute on the uh, business models and the transformation of the industry in, uh, in um, Latin America. Um, you can see uh, in, in terms of the um, transformation and in terms of the spectrum allocation, uh, a lot of the data, and I think, I think Mario, you may have more data on that. Uh, a lot of the data shows that the uh, allocation of the spectrum, the allocation of the resources of the spectrum, it's really correlated with the penetration of mobile broadband. Uh, countries like Brazil uh, have a lead in the penetration of the broadband, around 35% of the uh, customers. Uh, uh, the same with Chile. Uh, other countries which allocated less uh, broadband in the last few years, including Mexico, including Colombia, have significant lower penetrations uh, in terms of mobile broadband. Uh, usually about half of the penetration of the, the first countries which allocated more, more amount of uh, spectrum. Why is this important? When you look at the Internet of Things, uh, one of the key elements in building a, uh, a um, industry around the uh, Internet of Things is the availability, availability of broadband, availability of fixed broadband, as well as availability of mobile broadband. But it's not enough to have broadband. Uh, then uh, when, when I'm going to show the uh, market segmentation, <laughs> it should be somewhere there. Don't worry, it's coming. Um, when, when I show the uh, market segmentation, uh, you'll see that certain applications in Internet of Things require massive amount of data, it requires massive amount of data processing, require business intelligence on top of it, but also requires speeds that are not uh, transmission speeds or, or interconnection speeds, which are not common in the two and a half G and 3G technologies. That pushes, as, as uh, uh, presenter showed yesterday, that pushes the envelope to our not only LTE, but um, technologies like 5Gs, which are just at the horizon right, right now. So in the, in the delivery of the um, internet, uh, internet of Things, we need to consider the evolution of the network. And uh, certain segments of the Internet of Things will be available like machine to machine, uh, very low amounts of data coming from metering, coming from uh, traffic management, uh, can be transmitted today. But large amounts of data uh, requires actually a huge um, uh, network transformation, if you want, this huge network redesign uh, to handle the amount of data over the mobile network. And also requires um, the creation of a cloud computing, the creation of business intelligence, of analytics in the cloud to respond also very fast 
to the amount of data collected. That sounds like the beginning. Okay. This is a machine to machine, right? <laughs> no, no human in the loop. <laughs> okay, uh, if we, yeah, do you have a remote? You, you can work from there. Okay, if we can go to slide number one, it would be number great. One, okay. okay. What is the up button on? Okay. So now we start the real presentation. If we look at uh, really affecting uh, the um, affecting the uh, masses, affecting the people in in a country, uh, how the Internet of Things will enrich the the life of people? We have to start with the people. And we talked a lot in, uh, yesterday and, and today about smart devices, smart networks, and uh, also about uh, uh, smart services. Now, to get there, I pretty much look at what requires to create an IoT ecosystem. The first thing, I talked a little bit about it, is the creation of the network, LTE, uh, and eventual evolution to 5G. Why is this important, actually? Uh, 5G is around the, is still at the horizon line. 3GPP is still working on the, the standards. We don't even know roughly what is going to be. Think of spectrum. We allocate spectrum for 10, 15, 20 years. If we do not consider these technologies today, the spectrum we will allocate will have stamp on it LTE or 3G. It will be too late to change. You, you're planning 20 years ahead. It's frightening, right? We talked also about addressing. All these devices have to be addressable. Like, uh, like Intel said, 85% of the devices are not uh, even network. We need to address them individually. And actually, uh, a more complex device may have hundreds of addresses, different sensors, different actuators, different motors, and so on. So we need a lot of addresses. IPv6 is the response to that. Fortunately, the, the industry is moving in the right direction you know, on IPv6. We talked about uh, small four factors, cheap devices. Um, my, my, uh, the presenters behind me did a, 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 an excellent job talking about this. Massive storage and processing. But actually, the cloud. It's not always real time. And as I'll explain later, when you drive a, a, a car and maybe some information you require in order to avoid an accident, it's in the cloud. You need a new type of cloud, one which responds really quickly and uh, correctly. And the economy, how you connect the regulations and the economics in order to create uh, the right spectrum strategy. Gardner publishes the, uh, the famed uh, technology cycle. Let's look where the Internet of Things is. This thing should have a laser. But if you look at the top of the slide, the Internet of Things is right on the top of the peak of inflated expectations. This is where we are today. So everything we're talking today, it's colored about our expectations that the Internet of Things will happen today or tomorrow. And as you can see, connecting machines to machines is still a problem. But Internet of Things is not one. It's actually a collection of different technologies. And what I marked here in the red, there are uh, things from um, the uh, connected home, cloud computing, uh, mobile home, uh, sorry, mobile health uh, monitoring, different points on this, uh, on, the, on this curve. In order for the industry to really reach uh, its uh, economic, um, economic uh, um, 
point where it's actually cost effective, we need to be on this side of the cloud. Look how many technologies have to migrate to the right in order for the Internet of Things to become a viable economic model. Now, in, uh, in preparation for the IoT, uh, uh, growing numbers of countries are actually uh, changing or evolving their policies. If you look on the graph on the left, it's actually a number of countries, including uh, is the, the, uh, um, the minister uh, mentioned yesterday, including Colombia with Vive Digital, including Mexico is the Red Compartida, the, the, uh, the uh, beginning of my presentation. They are looking to expand the mobile uh, coverage and mobile, uh, mobile um, network penetration to all the services. But also, they are including more and more policies on the digital agenda. What's important on this curve, if you look where it started, very few countries started these policies. Now, about half of the world has uh, focused on policies, not only on spectrums, but digital agenda, um, massive deployment of broadband technologies, primarily mobile today, uh, as well as the uh, um, uh, um, propagation of things like e-commerce and, and mobile coils and so on. If you look on the slide on the right, on the uh, graph on the right, uh, you can see where the countries are in terms of a broad, a broadband speed and penetration. Uh, Colombia, it's right at the beginning of the graph, uh, about 50% penetration today, or last year actually, the data, and the broadband speeds have to really pick up in order to reach the countries that can deploy IoT today, which are on the upper right corner of the, the slide. We're talking evolution or revolution. I really don't know the answer. I don't know if IoT is an evolution or a revolution. It seems to be a collection, actually, of evolving things and the tipping point, eventually, which will create a revolution. But uh, books have been written and, uh, and studies have been conducted on already trillions. And we're not to uh, talking about billions. We're talking about really next order of magnitude of um, of sensors and on, of devices and humans connected to the internet. How this will evolve as a whole, how this will change the life of people, it's really something I would like to talk a little bit more in details today. So I mentioned already that uh, the Internet of Things demands increased uh, network performance. On the left-hand side is mobility. And it's really connected to enriching the life of the people, starting with cars and shopping and, and homes and cities, you know, personal uh, safety, health, and so on. On the right-hand side, it's really the Internet of Things uh, for the industry. If you look there, uh, the, the um, enterprise part of the Internet of Things seems to be more connected to fiber optics and fixed broadband. Why is that? Companies don't move. Even if you have robotics inside the plant, you need a high volume of data which stays inside that plant. So when, when we're looking at the demands, one dimension is mobile versus fixed. The second dimension is related to reaction time. If you drive a smart car, you're talking about milliseconds on applying the brakes. The human can do it in half a second, so if the machine doesn't do it faster, there's no need for it. Other, other um, uh, models of the IoT business require responses from seconds. You walk in a, sh in a shop, you don't want to wait uh, half an hour until uh, your coupon shows up, for instance. Two safe cities which may, uh, may uh, require reactions in seconds. Why is this important? Let's look at the model of a car. Th this is a, actually a slide uh, that I, I got from uh, Daimler. 
uh, in, uh, was a conference in Fraunhofer. And um, the director of I, uh, IoT actually came and actually shocked me because he said, your LTE is too slow. We are, this is two years ago, LTE was still an in infancy. What do you mean it's too slow? He said, here it is. Two cars are cl coming one close to the other. And our sensors are telling that the collision will happen in 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds. How do you prevent that? You have only 200 milliseconds to apply the brakes. What do you do? The LTE network is not fast enough for that. And car-to-car -car communication is not fast enough. And by the way, this is licensed spectrum. You cannot broadcast in it. So what do you do? Really, we're looking at cases where vast amounts of data have to be exchanged very quickly in an emergency situation between millions of moving vehicles. Reliability, you know, the famous five nights availability of the network must be there. High speed network connections, latency. Latency, again, is very important. 4G technologies have relatively low latency if you compare them to 3G, but not enough for this example. And processing vast amounts of data. We talked about 5G already. 5G, it's around the corner. It's a, somewhere between a standard and a concept, or a concept and a standard, regardless, uh, regarding really the, the sequence. What it's promising are really things which will meet the requirements of, of uh, a moving car. Uh, but if you look at this, um, this example, it also indicates a fragmentation of the requirements for the spectrum. From high throughput, low throughput, like multi-user telepresence, to high density of links, for instance, in a stadium, common problem today, how you offer services to you know, 50,000 people cramped in one square kilometer, to emergency services which require uh, very little delay as well as they require a high um, output of data. This is what is the 5G promises. But 5G is still not here. Did any country allocate its spectrum for 5G? No. 20 years, right? New challenges are also for how to make money with these technologies. Let's remember that all the service providers today are private companies. Very, very few exceptions. Um, Ecuador comes to my mind where you still find some carriers which are uh, owned by the government, fully owned by the government. So let's go back to what we talked uh, a couple of slides ago. We have to go between fixed networks, networks with limited mobility, and fully mobile networks, different levels of latency, different net. Uh, these networks really do not exist today. Quality of service, quality of experience is still in its infancy really in terms of deployment in real life situations. Yes, we do have the technologies. Yes, yes, we do have the standards for that. Yes, we have the models, the architectures. But creating these this, um, uh, architectures in real life, in a massive, you know, deployed to millions of people. Remember the theme of this presentation, it's, it's about actually the um, enriching the life of all the people. We are still years away from that. Spectrums, of course, spectrum, of, of course, plays a role. A lot of the 2G, 3G networks still have to be amortized. In this region, in particular, we're still deploying a lot of 3G technologies. Huawei deploys a lot of 3G technologies. We're replacing the older 3G with the new 3G. So the move to LTE, as I'll show, is fairly slow. So we're also talking about spectrum, LTE versus GPRS. Efficiency, efficiency of using the spectrum. We do have today technologies uh, available to reduce the, um, to increase the efficiency of the spectrum, to reduce the stress on, on, uh, on governments to deploy a new spectrum. However, however, we also 
locked ourselves when we issued licenses for these technologies. So even if the service providers wants to change, and they have the funds, and they have the economics, and they have the customers, they cannot change because that spectrum cannot be or reallocated or refarmed to LD. So it's, it's a balance, again, remember 20 years changes. It's a balance. The uh, spectrums which were allocated 10 years ago, they are still under a license and an obligation to actually deploy edge technologies. Let's keep going. So I'll, I'll go quickly through IPv6 and, and the uh, big data and M to M. This is the situation of IPv6 in the region. Mexico, Panama, still very low on deployment. Now, uh, if you look at Colombia, it's actually moving up. Uh, Ecuador and Venezuela. Venezuela, interestingly, deployed a lot of uh, uh, IPv6 uh, technologies. Um, this is a transformation which is necessary, but it needs to be synchronized also with spectrum allocation with uh, LTE penetration and the other technologies in itself doesn't move us to IoT. It just gives us the fundamentals so we can create the addresses for sensors for new devices. This slide had been on, uh, on another presentation yesterday. Really, uh, if we look at the industry, the whole industry has to move in the Internet of Things, according to this research by Business Intelligence. Uh, in about two, three years, we'll have more devices that require or behave in the IoT that we had in the smartphones, tablets combined. Now, planning for big data. Latin America. Still, most of the planning is two years ahead of us. Again, technologies exist. This is a Huawei example uh, of performance. Performance is increasing. Maybe actually waiting a little bit longer. Since again, performance increases, but I'm not recommending that. Um, companies are starting to spend already in a lot of money in the big data, uh, storing it, processing, and actually trying to use this big data to create new business models to create better decision processes. But this is not yet in the phase of uh, IoT. It's not big data which is collected from uh, devices. It's more big data which is collected from existing IT systems. Let's go into the economics of the big data. Um, the effects of digital economy had been discussed, studied, uh, assumed, we've seen figures where we're saying that introduction of uh, ICT technologies can move an economy uh, up by one, two, three percent of the GDP over a year. Um, the region is still in, uh, in uh, terms of using the uh, uh, ICT technologies, of, uh, in terms of using uh, big data, uh, Latin America, it's, uh, it's in a catch-up mode. Uh, and I think yesterday, again, the, uh, uh, the ICT minister, the TIC minister of uh, Colombia, talked about the drive toward achieving the, the goal of uh, pushing the economy up. He also gave us some numbers on uh, the impact of the e-economy on Colombia. What is more important, actually, it's uh, the correlation of the plans for deploying broadband with the plans to develop a, a, a software industry, uh, an applications industry, to match the, uh, the development of these technologies. It's, uh, when I try to look at the total IoT impact on, uh, on the uh, Latin America mobile network, I found the data somewhat conflicting. Uh, 4G, uh, the, uh, 4G Americas, uh, estimates about uh, 50, 55 million people connected or broadband connections to LTE in about three years from now. If you look at the, uh, the data about mobile connections, LTE will still represent in three years about 10% of the 500 million people 
uh, which is broadband connections. Also, uh, interestingly, and a, a little bit alarming, is the M2M connectivity is very low. We're talking about millions, millions and millions of devices to be connected uh, around that time. It doesn't match the connectivity of broadband. I don't have an answer why the, the data in Latin America doesn't show a higher growth in M2M, which is a precursor, which is a part of the IoT. Um, if it's any analyst in the room, I would like to ask him or her to maybe look again into this data because I don't see a correlation. I don't see really a trend pushing IoT in, in, uh, in the region. I talked a little bit about business models. Let me take, take you back for a second there. The typical uh, human um, customer in a mobile network receives really, the consumer is directly a customer to the mobile operator in the classic model. Um, 95, actually about 98% of the subscribers in the world today are directly customers of an operator, MNO, mobile network operator. Only 3-4% are through an MVNO or another arrangement. This model needs to change. Why? Because connectivity, it's, as I showed at the beginning of the presentation, it's only one of the components of the, uh, deploying uh, the Internet of Things. The others are, uh, are uh, big data analytics, uh, automation, um, knowledge, uh, industry, you know, things like robotics. In other words, there is the need of a additional uh, layer to take the connectivity, to apply the business intelligence, the cloud services, and to create actually the, um, uh, uh, the Internet of Things uh, closed loop between machines, decision makers, and, and back to acting on the, uh, on the results of these decisions. So uh, I call this and I know the name had been used before, but I call them mobile virtual network aggregators. They aggregate sometimes, think, think of meter reading for instance, sometimes their uh, connectivity is very short, it's once a month or once a day, uh, and very low amounts of data, as uh, some of the presenters have shown before, uh, very low speed. This is not a business model for an operator which is actually uh, making the, the business on uh, selling minutes, SMSs, and uh, massive amounts of uh, data. So that needs to be aggregated on a different layer. And intelligence has to be applied to that uh, data. If you do metering and you want to change, or you, let's say you want to do fraud detection, you need, you need a lot of analytics and knowledge of the vertical industry in order to decide if the consumption of electricity or water or, uh, or gas is um, not meeting or it's meeting a, a, a fraud uh, pattern. So really, the, the industry will have to change in order to introduce the, uh, the Internet of Things. Last, last points, really. Spectrum. It's a spectrum conference. How are we going to allocate the spectrum today? So in the next 5, 10, 20 years, we won't say, oops, we gave all the spectrum to one uh, carrier. He, uh, this carrier is using only 10% of these resources. Uh, we are in a court case for 10 years, and nothing will happen. This spectrum is lost, actually. It's lost because it's locked in one technology. It's lost because there was no incentives, for instance, like incentive pricing for using the spectrum, it's actually, in a, sen in a sense, it's like money in the bank. It's, the spectrum is there, it's uh, available, but unused. So really, if we want to move uh, to the Internet of Things, when we start to think about spectrum policies today, we need to think about the uh, economic impact. We need to think about the, um, the um, 
people using and how they're going to use this resource. I understand it's scarce. I understand it's limited, but it's also wasted. So many models. I've, I'm not sure if you're going to talk about these models, but I think the next presentation will be on the models for spectrum, the next presentations. Uh, a lot of economic models. Can we trade spectrum if we don't use it? Any questions? And sorry for the machine to machine. I, it wasn't planned, really. <laughs>